Welcome to a Lunch with Biggie, a podcast about small business and creatives sharing their stories and inspiring you. My guests today decided to make their passion for exploring flavorful and fiery foods and creating sauces that focus on, focus on the middle ground um, where flavors and fire meet. Please welcome the flavor forward sauce king, Ale Goldschmidt of Fat Cat Foods. What's going on, Ale? Hey, sir. How you doing? Doing all right, man. Doing all right. Um, my first question, I really appreciate you taking the time to come chat with me. Um, I always like to ask the question, what's your favorite sandwich or go-to lunch? Favorite sandwich or go-to lunch? Um, you know, I, lately it, it's actually been like really spicy canned sardines on like sourdough bread. Really? Would you put yeah, any condiments or anything like that? What, like, uh, obviously what fat cat sauce you put on it or anything? I, it, to be honest, they come in this like flavorful oil. We get them. I get them from a guy who, who said, buys them from Portugal, and they're just fantastic. And my wife bakes bread once a week, and it's a, usually lunch is like a five minute affair too. So it's it's uh, whatever I can snag, scarf down, and then you kind of feel the burn. If there's sauce, then there is, but but most of the time, it's just that sauce is more for the eggs on breakfast or or or, or something else. I like that. I like that. I like the fact that you you're getting fresh made bread every week. You're a lucky man. It's, um, it's it's something she she does. Uh, we can't buy bread or do anything else because if, if she doesn't make her bread, then uh, then there, there's trouble for me and everyone else. I like that. How? Let me ask a question on that. Even though I know she's, I know Deborah's not around or uh, to answer it, but like, how do, do you guys have like a cutter for it? Because I'm like, I know sometimes that's a hard thing to do if you're slicing to make a sandwich, uh, like to get the even slices and stuff like that. She's got like like uh, like ceramic molds that she makes the bread in, so they're real crusty and stuff. And to be honest, once you just get a good serrated knife and it kind of you just gauge, you know. I love She's it. Been doing it for years, so oh, we just have man. the we have the slicing guy, but we do have the deli slicer in case it gets a little a little oh, iffy. We can run I'm it through there. Super jealous right now. <laughs> oh, super jealous. <laughs> All right, so I, I wet some appetite telling people a little bit about like you know about the fact that you started with sauces. Tell folks about Fat Cat Foods and your sauces. Tell people a little bit about that. Um, well, we started in 2010, which is a really long time for a small company. Um, and we really just started I, as a hobby. Like a lot of people in this industry, you start just making stuff. Uh, my mother's from South America. My dad's from the Middle East. I grew up with a lot of table condiments. And when I got out on my own and started cooking for myself, I missed having those condiments instead of just relying on stuff. So I started making things, you know, just family recipes and then started paying attention to other stuff. And the condiments I like the most, are, you know, like I like spice, but I also like stuff where it enhances food, where you're yeah. thinking about like something in the middle of the table that you're spooning on meat or, or like that special relish that goes on a sandwich or something. I, I, that, that usually makes the whole thing for me sometimes, even if everything else is perfect, that's like the, the icing on the cake. Yeah. And so we kind of just started putting stuff together and, uh, you know, first you make it yourself and then you learn how to commercialize it. And then it turns from a, from a, being a cook into almost like being a food scientist because you have to learn all the science and everything like that. I didn't have any experience. I, I came from a journalist background. So uh, I had to kind of learn this over the first couple of years on, on what it takes to, to know what makes something shelf stable without adding a lot of preservatives or anything like that. And, and then how to sell it and then how to connect it and then how to keep your flavors pure. And then also to tell people how to use it. And that's kind of what, we do every day. Yeah. And and that's the, that's the impressive part about it. Cause like, um, to me, that was the part that I always find very interesting is the aspect that you started homemade and then, you know, and then you basically went to world of commercial, you know, doing it more commercialized with local packers, um, in that transition. And I'm always kind of curious about like, what was the transition time from you doing that? Like doing it at your, doing it at home, maybe doing like, I mean, we, I'm assuming you, you I know you started off doing farmers markets and stuff like that, but was it one of those things where you first started at home doing farmers markets and then as you saw the growth, you then went to commercial, you went commercialized with a packer, um, you know, because obviously that's like a huge transition going from at home recipe to now doing, like you said, shelf stable, you know, um, larger quantities, way larger quantities than what you mm -hmm. were doing at home and stuff like that. Tell me a little bit about that transition. So when you start, you're kind of a cook and you're making stuff. And, and our big moment where we had it was one of one of my wife's uh, co-workers. You know, I just whipped something up for a barbecue for family and work people to come over. And he took like the whole container home with him and like served it to people at, at a barbecue he was having the following week. And we're like, hey, that's pretty that's pretty cool that he would just like do that. And uh, 
so you start that way and then you kind of build it. And then the hard part you don't understand is, is it takes a lot of effort. And I mean that like you don't understand it when you're getting into it is that uh, it takes a lot of effort, not just to make it, but also to sell it. And you get to a point where, you know, you're, I'm hitting markets all over the Southeast at one point. Uh, every, every, I mean, I think I was traveling five days a week, just, just going anywhere from Miami all the way up to, to like Raleigh and just trying to find a place where you could connect with people. And then you realize you still got to make more product. You can't yeah. do it. So then you have to, you know, sit down, do your numbers. Uh, if I can make six months worth of stuff and store it here, because it is a shelf stable product, uh, how much more ground can I cover? And then it just kind of becomes a, you look at the numbers and the numbers, you know, one of the things about a small business, at least for me, is that when you start to analyze it and see the patterns in it, it tells you where the next step is. And so you just sit there and go, well, heck, if I can just, you know, invest X, Y, Z amount now into supplying everything and storing it, then I can just pick it up and that saves me the time and effort and the aggravation of having to be up until three in the morning, you know, putting hot liquid into, into jars with, with, you know, they fall on the ground and then everybody thinks someone's breaking in the house. And uh, so it just becomes a, you know, stare at the numbers and, and do it. That's kind of how, how it materializes. And then you get the time to market more. The marketing is, is I think way harder than, than making it, yeah. making it, you, you know, you have uh, this idea that you're a chef and really you're not, you're a manufacturer. And the manufacturer has to get an idea of how to manufacture and get that down. And then at the same time, how to sell it. I mean, I, you probably see it with, with, with clothes because you're getting it. And then yep. it's kind of, you know, you, now you have your stockpile. Without the stockpile, can you imagine pressing them all like to order or something? Yeah, I know it, people who do that. It is cra- it's definitely crazy. So, Ale, when you did it, like, what was your time frame? What was the time frame? Because obviously, like, 2010, like, when you, and then what was your time frame? Like, was this one of those things where you're like, I'm going to start doing, so I'm going to start doing fat cat sauce. And I'm ba- literally not going to be. Wor- I'm, this is like going to be my full time thing, and and you're doing because you like literally gave me a time frame of going, you know, five days a week, and all of, and you know traveling everywhere. Like, I mean, obviously, I don't. I'm assuming you didn't start like that quick. What was the transition time from the time of you doing that to like all of a sudden now you're traveling everywhere and and now finding a packer? Um, I, you know, was it like a few yeah. months? No, I think it took about uh, three or four years because you still okay. I still work in. Um, and then you try to pack in what you can on the weekends yep. and then hopefully you have a boss that's forgiving enough that gives you the three days or the four days or you yeah. understand, or you throw, throw a lot of excuses or you throw a lot of sick time or however it works, yeah. you know, stuff happens. Um, and after three or four years, you realize, you, you know, again, you look at the numbers and you look at your gut yeah. and you're like, let's, let's give it a shot because there's nothing else, you know? So, and then you just, it's, you know, the hard part is, is when you lose that, that paycheck. And then you realize that you have to make the paycheck again and then it's on the fire the realization. Yep. Yep. And so it kind of gets you to hustle a little bit more. And also, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I, I'm thankful that, that Deb was also very supportive too. And, and, and that's a biggie in part, no pun intended. Yeah. Um, you know, that's a, it's, it's a big part too with the, with, with, cause if you don't have a supportive family, it's hard to do it. I've seen that yeah. kind of crumble other businesses too, where, mm-hmm. where one side doesn't understand the work and, and commitment involved. So um, at the three and four year mark, is that when the co-packer started coming in or was that, or was that, or did you bring, decide to bring them in sooner than, than that when you decided to take the next step? It was, it was, uh, I think somewhere around the 18 month to two year mark okay. is where the co-packer. And then what we did was you don't find your patterns that you have a whole lot of sauce and you're like, what do I do with all this sauce? What do I, you know? And then you start realizing that you hustle and you, you, you chisel it down a little bit. Uh, but at that point, it was just it was just aggravating to you know you're you're, you're going to bed at three thirty in the morning after doing you know so many stickers and 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 you know yep. heat heat guns and stuff like that and then you so that that was really about it yeah about that time um, and a little bit earlier than some I know some who who uh, they're waiting for large accounts to come in before they make the transition but you know the hard it's it's I think it's better to have the surplus because you kind of see the idea of of how the, the, the supply and demand moves mm-hmm. and then you get your patterns going and then you realize as you build your sales channels, how that, that moves. And, uh, well, and it also helps yeah. that you have something that's like shelf stable. So that's kind of yes. a, a positive aspect of it. Yeah, um, yes, absolutely. Tell folks a little bit about how you came up with the sauces and the names and then, uh, and then like who the heck was, uh, who was, ta- who was taste testing these recipes? Ah, uh, so, uh, the name itself, we, we had a 23-pound cat at the time. She's not with us anymore. 
Uh, but she was a large, large, large cat, like very small head. And kind of when she sat on the ground, she just kind of splayed out. And it was like a rug of a cat. Okay. And she was just, we we're just sitting there going, hey, we, we have these, uh, these recipes and we're looking at how do we move forward? And the cat was just there and we're like, holy crap, she's a really big cat. And then we just Googled and see, saw if, if fat cat sauces was, was available. Yeah. Uh, it was also a big step because a lot of people don't. Don't do that. They just assume their 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 name of their company is their own, and then they kind of go in there. And you have to kind of go with the trademarks and see what's available. Um, but so that that's how we got the name of the. And we're we're cat people. We've I've had cats all my life, and and uh, uh, my wife's also a big a big cat person. And uh, the recipes themselves, some of them were family recipes. We started with five five products originally. Um, three of them were family recipes. Um, two were things I actually tried to crib off of something like one was a sauce in the Caribbean, which we have like a Caribbean curry sauce. That, mm-hmm. uh, my wife and I went to, to St. Martin and we ate a little curry shop and this old lady had this fantastic table sauce there. And we just, I just couldn't get enough of it. I think I went through like three bowls in the sitting and then I, I tried to take it back with me, you know, like in a little styrofoam container. And you couldn't, right? I put it in my <laughs> luggage and it just exploded over the luggage. So that was the, the attempt to recreate that. Cause I was dumb enough not to just go buy like a wine bottle or something yeah. and pour it in there. Um, and then as, as we materialized, some of the sauces are things that we, you know, it's a flavor that we'd like to explore. And also at the same time, you see the need for the market that you're catering to your customers tell you, wouldn't it be great if you had this type of sauce or that type of sauce. And, and that's kind of how things migrate towards it. Um, and, and also as you materialize and grow, because of the the science involved, a lot of what you do doesn't necessarily come from a recipe standpoint, but also you get familiar with what the shelf stability of certain ingredients are. Um, like what we have, a, we made our strawberry sauce, for example, that mm-hmm. was, we were approached by some people in Plant City to make the sauce uh, for the festival and they were going to private label it. And then we were like, strawberries, what do we do? How much, what's, do we need to know the sugar content? How much more do we need to add? And then you work with a, a food technician, like an FDA technician to kind of develop how that goes without, you know, the whole thing turning to crap in the middle. Yeah. Um, so that's, it, that's crazy. And do you have like family, like who tastes some of this stuff? I know, uh, I know I've heard some, some, uh, some of my friends who are your part of your family, they, they've had to come over and, uh, and sample some, uh, sample some goods I've heard. Yeah, yeah, we, we do have what we call the does it suck phase uh, where we, we build samples and we've actually had like like uh, pretend barbecues come on over for a barbecue and really, you know, there's like very little food and it's all just tasting stuff. Um, <laughs> I, I like that idea, actually. And, and like, <laughs> convince wife, them with food wife, and then be like, nope, no food, just sauces, sauces yeah, and just, chips. Just, just bowls of, of, of sauce <laughs> with variations and and, uh, and they're like, oh, I thought we were having chicken or something. Um, we, yeah, we do, we do stuff like that. I know, uh, uh, we do have relatives who, who we do run prototypes by, uh, Deb's, uh, work has a lot of people from different cultures and, yep. and, and ethnicities. We, we have had them line up in our office, come in, give us feedback, and then we sign up and then bring back variations. It's, it's, it's a long process, but, uh, it's good because you want, you want as many, as much feedback as you want, no matter how passionate you are about a product, you, you can't defend it once it's out of your hands. So you want to, yeah. you want to see what the reaction is. No, I, I totally, uh, I totally get that. Yeah. And definitely the more different palettes that you can get to try it, the better. Um, Mm -hmm. so I know that I think I looked and I think you have like close to like 15, like, I think it's like 15 sauces or so you've been recognized like on CNN food and wine. I've seen you on mashed and a variety of other ones. I know those are like the most recent ones I've seen. Um, how have you been able to stand out in like it's such a what I would consider a congested sauce market? Because there is like a, there's obviously a lot of different people have produced and created sauces. What do you think has been your your secret recipe to kind of have you stand out um, amongst the amongst the masses of sauces? Um, one, I think we don't really compete to try to be the hottest. We've never tried to be the hottest. We yeah. use flavor and heat as a compliment. And I think there's a there's a large market for that who doesn't just want to destroy themselves like hot ones or something. Um, the other part is I think our flavors are kind of very clean. Um, and three, I think our branding is fun. It's, it's funny. And, and uh, if we can throw in a cat pun or a poop joke or something like that, then, then why not? Because it's, it's, 
one it's it's this is probably one of the only fields where you're you're required to make the poop jokes yeah and um you know you're gonna hurt more tomorrow than you are today and things like that you know <laughs> this is this is like you know you can have a board meeting and that can come up for something like this and uh so, and i think that's part of it the other part I, I, is just longevity um a lot of people expect a quick payoff on, on any sort of investment a lot of businesses are usually on a three to five year turn and, yeah. and food is slow and so I think if you just stay grounded, you, you stay true to what you're doing and just keep hustling and, uh, you know, make sure that your, your customers are happy, both both wholesale and direct. And, and, and you just your reputation grows that way. Yeah, I, I know that um, how we actually met. Um, well, ironically, like it's like I kind of realized later on later on, it's like very small world type of thing. But the way we met was we actually met, if I remember correctly, it was like a Yelp elite event that you were at it was like we were at one particular place it was called hot crust and oh, yeah. you were there because your sauces were actually part of like at the restaurant where we're like a, available as a condiment to be used on any of the sandwiches and you were there and then i got to meet you and i was just impressed because like after i met you i literally saw you everywhere like i everywhere i went you were somehow always doing like a tasting somewhere uh whether it was like a supermarket or another market or i was seeing your sauces somewhere and I remember every time I gone, I don't do it now as much because I kind of got tired, not in a bad way, but I got tired of you're everywhere. I, I've actually been very happy to see that you're everywhere because so, I would take pictures and be like, hey, look, I saw you here. And you're like, yeah, or I would bump into you at like a at a tasting. So I know for you, like, obviously, like, I think that's like, can you talk a little bit about the importance of that, like in human interaction and having to have. Um, you know, especially when you're trying to, even though you've, as you've grown, you're still doing these things, whether it's at like a, a festival or a market, um, a specialty market and stuff like that. Um, the importance of actually that interaction and having that like sample and, and being able to have that interaction with customers. Um, it's, it's, it's key because a lot of people won't try something they haven't, they won't buy something they haven't tried. And that's the easiest way is to, to get out in front of them, especially locally, um, we, 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 we do it mostly not just to, to market ourselves, but you do it as a, as a courtesy to your, your wholesale customers. Uh, so if any of my customers ask me, Hey, would you like to do an event? I'm always happy to, cause I'm happy that they're supporting us by taking us yeah. in and promoting us in store or in a restaurant or something like that. There's times where of course you can't do it. Like if we're selling somewhere in the other side of the country, uh, you try to work something out with them or you, you hire somebody in the middle to kind of do it. Yeah. Otherwise it's, it, it gets kind of cost prohibitive, but it, it, you have to, you know, most of the stores that we work with, if they're looking for some sort of support where we can get somebody to try our product and hopefully convince them that, that they like it, then, then we'll do something like that. It's, it's, it's essential. There's no, I don't think there's a food product out there that shouldn't be doing it. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. Um, you mentioned, you mentioned wholesale. So I'm kind of curious. Um, Cause I know that you do. Um, I know you're on, I believe a bound. Are you also on fair or are you just on a bound? And uh, on, yeah, unfair, unfair, abound. And then there's another one called Tundra, which we also work with. And then there's a lot of little independent uh, uh, versions of that that come out, things that, that pop up and pop out uh, for a while, like especially in the early days of the pandemic, all these little places kind of flourished. And then little by little, the big guys either got bought, yep. you know, the little guys got bought by the big guys and stuff. But um, they've been pretty helpful, uh, especially uh, uh, some of them have like virtual trade shows that you can go and kind of do something like, like this zoom thing with, with other people. Um, and in some times I know we we've, I've gone to like Dallas and Minneapolis and stuff through those channels to do like a, uh, like a private trade show or a sub trade show and another to, to get in front of more, more wholesale buyers and stuff. But it, it's pretty neat. It, it's kind of different. Uh, and also the, the buy-in is much less than what you would for a traditional trade show. Trade shows are, are super expensive, yeah. like 10,000 bucks for some. So mm -hmm. it's uh, anything you can do to get out there and kind of help. No, I totally get that. And, and I was always curious because, so I just recently started on fair to try to start mm -hmm. selling my stuff on fair, whether it's like, and I'm starting small. Like I went with the route of like doing first stickers and ammo pins. And I've just mm -hmm. now little by little, I'm adding shirts to it. Um, but I never thought of it. I don't, and that's why I was kind of curious. Cause like, I think I, I think you also do Amazon too, right? So do, do you do Amazon, Amazon as well? Yeah. So yeah. I guess I, what I'm curious of is never have an issue with, I, I never even thought of doing like, not like just because I'm on fair doesn't mean I can't do the other one abound. I know some people I've had some guests in the past, they do their website, they do Etsy and then they do fair. Like they're pretty mm -hmm. much like, I'm going to scatter myself everywhere. Um, well, you, you know, yeah. type of thing. I, I suggest it. 
I okay. suggest it. Yeah. And fair, fair is apparently very good for, for clothing brands. Yeah. Um, like they have their own clothing. Uh, um, happy to chat with you more offline. I've been on it for, I think four years now. Okay. Um, and uh, there's definitely, it takes a little time to grow on it, but once you connect with, with, with the right, uh, it, all of them are, are, they have their own place. Yeah. Um, but there's no reason you shouldn't do as much as you can. I think one, especially if you're relying on, on Google for a lot of your, your, your advertising or your, your search results, getting in all those places definitely helps um, because you're showing up more and things like that. And then also it shows that the, the impression that you're, you're, you can handle multiple markets at the yeah. same time. Uh, even if you're not, you know, like our, our, I think our business on fair is much better than it is on some of the other ones. Yeah. Um, but having them everywhere, the, the idea is that you have a lot of uh, capability and, and reliability and, and you're, you know, you're not going to be bogged down by small, small issues and things like that. Yeah, no, I, I love that. I think that's a, uh, that's uh, to me, that's like a huge, uh, like a, my light, like a little light bulb. And like when I was like doing my research and I kept, cause ironically, when I do Google you, when I Googled you to kind of just see other stuff, you did pop up as an abound. Uh, and I was like, Oh, that's interesting. He's on abound. I wonder if he's on fair. I was like, and then I saw him like, Oh wait, he's on Amazon as well. I was like, I was like, he's everywhere. I'm like, this is uh this is really impressive. Now are you still, cause I know obviously you're doing copac, you have a co-packer and everything like that, Co-pack, yeah. but they're not, they're not packing your stuff and mailing your wholesale orders out. Or is that actually, still you are you still putting labels on things no no everything's assembled at the co-packer the the, you know um what we do is we have a split where where the the like the first level of distribution is out of the co-packer and then the second level which is like pick and pack and and things like that depending on where it's going in some places you go to an intermediary and in some cases you handle it yourself uh local stuff obviously is much easier to handle yeah uh, out of out of our warehouse but uh, yeah, it's it's just the uh, the packers the packers like the center of everything. It's it's kind of the bloodline, and, and you kind of tell them what you want to do, and how they do it, and then they have a method, and then they'll tell you can they fulfill it or do they want to hand it off to a secondary. Uh, again, it's 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 manufacturing. It's 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 you have to think of it in that line instead of being the cool chef or the hot sauce dude or the barbecue barbecue sauce dude or something like that. It's it's just the process. What's the process? How do you how do you use your method into the, into their process and how can you adjust and things like that yeah no i think that's great for uh for someone since you were talking about the different types of sauces for someone being introduced to your sauces what would you say are your top ones that you would recommend like if someone were to say hey i'm gonna i'm like especially if they're listening to this and they're like oh i'm kind of curious about his different sauces and 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 what he has and what he provides what would like and i know you guys have samplers and stuff like that available sample packs what are some ones that you would recommend um as your top ones that you would think you would recommend for someone because like i tend to have it's kind of interesting because like in my palate like i don't think i have a super hot palate but my but if i talk to my wife and my daughter they say i do they think i can eat spicier than they can so they so in that sense like obviously so I'm always intrigued because you're right. There's like the hot ones where it's like you want to scold your mouth. And to me, that's not I don't I appreciate the fact that you're flavor forward. You know, it's like that whole flavor forward, heat fo- versus heat forward um, aspect of it. And so I'm like, I'm always kind of intrigued with that because like obviously you can be turned off by like, oh, I don't like hot sauces. But in re- in your case, like you have you're adding it's more of like a flavor forward type thing being added to your sauces. We we I, I, we consider it a proper condiment more than a hot sauce. We okay. just have to be we where we where we fall into the the category list is in hot sauce, and that's kind of why we have to pick the bottle style and the other things. But we consider it more of a, of a of a condiment uh, because it's adding to food. Uh, most of the time, when I tell people what they would like, I have a conversation with them on yeah. what they like to eat yeah. and what they're putting it. Because some people, um, I, I've met, I've met grandmothers who've taken down ghost peppers if they're if it's in a bloody mary but they can't take it on on uh something you know a piece of chicken or something like that so a lot of times we learn its usage and then also the regionality of hot sauce is fantastic uh what what people consider hot say in louisiana versus what we consider hot here in florida is actually two different things yeah uh, we have a lot of Caribbean and stuff, and they like that kind of vinegar snap. Uh, upstate New York has that little bit of a, like a twang, like a Frank's Red Hot sort of thing. If I go out west, it's a lot thicker consistency with, with western, uh, southwestern sort of things. And the regionality of that kind of sticks in. So you, you learn where people are from and kind of uh, what, what they like to eat. And then you recommend the sauce I like um, instead of – yeah. I, I, I met these people at, uh, at the New York Festival last year who were from 
Maryland and they had fantastic stuff. But if you've been to Maryland, you know, that flavor with the celery salt and, mm -hmm. and the other things that goes on and their sauces were, were there. And I was like, wow, this is just like capturing the area right here. This is amazing. Or I met a guy from uh, um, uh, like South Dakota and it's very meatloaf and things like that. So all this stuff, like once you put it on that type of food, you understand where he's coming from. But if I'm putting it on like moho pork, it's like, yeah, this doesn't quite work for me. Yeah. Uh, so that, that's usually the first conversation. Um, we do, we don't do a lot of standard flavors. Um, we do a lot of kind of more exotic things, things that, you know, the flavors we like, well, Latin American, a little bit Asian. Um, we've had to adapt to a little more straight and narrow just as to, to go partially because part of the business involves private labeling and selling to the food service and stuff. And they need things a little more straight and narrow than these, these very specific flavors that are good for maybe two or three things. Um, so we have like a red jalapeno and a green jalapeno and things like that. Um, but if people are looking at our sauces for the first time, I would say look for like kind of unique flavors. Like uh, like our standards are puri puri sauce, which is which is a ginger garlic chili blend that's kind of Asian and kind of not Asian. Yeah. And uh, but you got to kind of try it because I can't really describe it much better yeah. than that. No, so, it makes uh, sense. It makes sense. What um when you started the white labeling, uh, and I'm I'm always intrigued by that. Um, is it something that you've approached them? I know you've I know some restaurants you've done like you've been there white like you've you were the one that produces it like based obviously a conversation is it something that they kind of like you actually will create will they use one of your sauces and you white label it or is it something that you've actually done for some where you're like this is your sauce um how does that usually work it, it it's a mix of both some people go uh we've had like oyster houses just white label stuff that's like our red jalapeno or habanero and carrot and things like that that just for because it, it's very uh, it, it's easy to use for them, but we've also worked with people to try to develop things themselves. Uh, the, the, the fact that we're using an intermediary to produce is something that you have to be kind of upfront with. If you're making it yourself, the batch sizes and stuff, cause you have to get the scientifics done. You still got to get it signed off by the FDA. You've got to get your, your chemicals, right. Your pH, right. All these other things. Uh, so they, I, I try to explain to them, uh, you know, most of the time they approach us and then we work with them and then you see if there's a fit, then you see if they can handle the demand of it. Cause the private label is a little trickier. Um, especially if it's a unique recipe for them, you have to make sure that, that they're going to hold the ownership, but they have to sell through what they want to make. And, and, uh, you know, it, it's, it's kind of hit or miss. I'm not sure I'm answering the question. No, I think you are. Way. I think you're right. I mean, it just kind of, there's different levels on what it is. Cause they could be like, Hey, we really like this sauce that you guys have can we make it like our, our sauce? And you're like, sure, we can white label it and do it this way. And you're buying it from mm -hmm. me type thing. And then it, then you, it obviously the level of complexity, if you have someone that's coming back and saying, well, we want to make our own sauce, then obviously you want to, you're like, okay, well then it's going to take this and we're going to have to do a little bit more. So it makes total sense um, going that route. I think that's, I'm always intrigued by the white labeling aspect um, of when, like, cause I, I'm always intrigued, even from like the, like, even as, as from small brand all the way out to like, when you go to like a, like a wholesale place or even like the supermarkets, like, and everyone's got like, I'm like, who's really making that? Like, that's not mm -hmm. made being made by that store. That's someone made by someone else. So I'm always intrigued by, uh, by that aspect. Um, it's, when it's, it's a it. huge business. There's actually yeah. an enormous trade show in Chicago every year called the private label association of America. And they do everything from usbs to to whatever you can imagine and then if you go to the facilities and things there's there's uh, you can't really trademark a recipe uh you can say like uh here's heinz ketchup but i'm gonna add like this is what i think it is or if even yeah. if you find out you can say i can add like a tablespoon more of salt and it becomes your own and so there's a lot of knockoffs a lot of people you think are and then a lot of businesses also have especially the really really large ones I, i'm talking heinz and things like that where they have 40 percent of their business tailored towards knocking off their own stuff but it's slightly different so that they can kind of own the market you know, it, it's it's big business yeah, yeah. It, it's a huge business but that, if you ever get a chance it's quite a fascinating uh, trade show to go to just 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 the things you never thought could be white labeled that's uh that hurts that's really interesting <laughs> i really i love that what what would be what, what would you say is um I, I guess would be your recipe for for like for success for someone in whether they're wanting to start something um you know or start like you know starting a business whether it's food related or not food related do you have any recipe for success that you've learned through along the way um that might help someone um i guess the the 
the first question you asked is if, if are they looking for an investment startup or are they looking for uh, to do it themselves um, and then kind of look at the expenses. It's hard, you, you know, the, the, a lot of, at least for, for hot sauce, the, the hot sauce is a very supportive community, even though there's a lot of it. Um, there, it's a very supportive community. So you have the opportunity to ask people, like I, I get asked a lot, Hey, what do I have to do to start? And a lot of people just don't know that, that the first call you have to make is like to the department of ag. So you can find out what your County needs in order to be licensed. And, and, and then you learn the scientifics and it's all, you got to take your canning courses and things like that. But a lot of this can be solved just by, by shadowing somebody for a little bit. If you're going in with, with investments and in, of course, then, then it's a different ball game and you have to set your targets and kind of know the industry a little bit more. Um, a lot of research I think is probably the better, the better thing. Um, like when we started, we, we spent a lot of time, not just with the sauces, but going to various markets to see how things look on the shelf and where our branding would fit had we had something there you know we did the mock-up and then we kind of tested it for ourselves and then you know you buy a lot of product to research you compare not just what it tastes like but what is it what is it you know when you see it on the shelf what makes you turn your head what do you like about it you know and then you be prepared for for not just crazy turns in in market but but trends trends happen just as fast as as, as global catastrophes and things like that um, like I, I, the truffle, truff hot sauce is, is a fantastic example. Um, these are people who uh, went in with a very high amount of capital and realized that they needed to build an audience first through Amazon and they put all their money into Amazon investing. So now you have to, you know, the, the advertising there. So you have to realize what are the costs and what's the benefit and how high can I sell my product for? And, and there's a little bit of testing. Yeah. Um, the one thing I always recommend people to do, well, the two things is, is, um, be patient and reactive. Know that you're not going to have it all figured out at the start. Um, definitely do the research. Get your you Google the name. Make sure you're not going to be stepping on anyone's, you know, trademarks or anything like that. Because that bites you in the butt more than you think. Um, and then be prepared to to shift a little bit because it's going to take everybody kind of starts in the same place. But they, once they develop their, you know, get their footing, then you have to kind of go with where that goes. Your market dictates where you're going, and then listen to that. Um, uh, you know, that's, and then the third is, is, is uh, this is the, 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 the best advice I ever got was if you look at your business as an onion and you're in the middle, you got to peel away all the layers before you get there. Cause if you rush through, you're just going to get like tears in your eyes, which I thought was very good. And then the I other like thing that. I always, I was always told was uh, don't, don't believe in the montage because, you know, if Michael J. Fox can go from the mailroom to the to the, the head of the business in, in like a 13 minute Night Rager song, it's not going to happen for you. You still have to fill in those gaps. Yeah. And sometimes those gaps take years. Um, you just have to be patient and kind of listen. And then the, the business tells you what, what it wants to do. It always does. Yeah. Um, the, the vision, I don't think, is as important as, as kind of getting your feet wet and learning, especially if it's a new industry. It's going to yeah. take a while, no matter how good your, your, your business is. You know, yeah. Your business plan is one thing, but, but you never know. No, I think oh, that's... more than you wanted to know. But... <laughs> no, man, I think that's awesome. I, I absolutely love it. So, Ale, I, I, we, I know we talked a little bit about it, and I know I brought up the fact of the whole thing with like a bound and like fair and all that stuff. I'm really intrigued by because I know that you obviously probably do. And I saw on your website because like you do the business to business type stuff where you're able to do wholesale. So I'm assuming you're not just using these. You're you're opening up all different. You basically from what I'm figuring out is you're kind of creating putting fishing poles everywhere in different parts of the pond to be able to fish and be able to find, you know, find. So like as someone like myself who's trying to grow and expand my exposure within the world of like doing wholesale and trying to grab my exposure. Do you have any advice for someone like me that's trying to either start up or someone who's like, who's just kind of maybe dip their foot in the, in the, in the, in the lake uh, or in the water to kind of see what the next thing is or how I can probably grow a little bit. Um, in, in terms of, of wholesale, the first thing you want to make sure is, is, is to understand what your wholesale uh, pack capabilities are how many like you do shirts so how many shirts come to a wholesale pack how many do you want your customer to buy um that's very important because that's kind of how you're packaging it the other thing that's also very important is what do you want your customer to sell it for um because you have to be i think at least from from my perspective you have to be competitive with what you're selling uh with your competitors uh so that you're not uh you know if i sell a six dollar bottle of hot sauce 
or something that needs to sell on the shelf for six dollars, I can't sell it to somebody for at a wholesale value of five twenty five. Correct. Because they have to make money on it. Um, and so you have to kind of find out what your what your margins are, and at the same time, uh, learn that if you're able to scale and use that, what, what level of scalability? Like, you know, the more stuff you buy, the lower price you're going to buy it for. How much of that stuff do I have to buy it for? But you have to look at the customer and how what they're selling it for and what they're selling your other stuff similar, and then work backwards. And that's 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 really the, the first step. Um, the second is learn how to price with a little bit of fluctuation because you want to add promotions to your stuff because promotions builds interest. Um, a lot of stuff is introductory promotions so that people are familiar with the brand. And at the same time, in, in addition to making a, a first impression, you want to kind of follow up and say, hey, your stuff's been on, on uh, my stuff's been on your shelf for 30 days. How's it been? Uh, you know, is it doing well? Why? If it's not doing well, why and what can I do? And showing that you, you can be connected and you're there to help, not just be somebody who, who gets, you know, X, Y, Z amount of money and then is out the door. Um, that's that's very key. You want to work with the retailers, even if there's a lot of retailers, you want to work with them. Let me ask you that about that. So if and, and I'm assuming you're talking in that aspect, like if someone's wholesaling, if someone's you're interacting, is, is this when you say that statement, is that something that's based out of like if even like if you let's say someone buys it from like a fair or something of one of those type of websites, mm -hmm. like messaging them through the system to be like, hey, how are things going? Um, you know, things like that. Or, or are we talking like from that from that point or even to like, of course, someone that is going coming directly to you to buy to wholesale from you directly, I'm assuming. Across the board, um, FAIR is, is is a channel. It's not really, uh, you know, I, I think of it as a catalog. If somebody buys my stuff out of the yep. catalog wholesale, I still have to. So you can message them through it. You can get their contact information. Um, you know, like a lot of small business, they're wearing a lot of hats, so their time is limited. But at the same time, they've chosen your stuff to be in their store. And so you have to kind of I think be respectful of that. You're not trying to, you know, wine and dine them and, and you know, close the Simmons account or whatever the hell they, they want, you know, <laughs> you know, it, it's nothing like that. It, it's, it, yeah. I, I see it more as like a partnership. This is yeah. the, sales itself is a game of relationships. Mm -hmm. And if people have taken your stuff and it's not successful, uh, you want to kind of don't say, Oh, well, it's not for you. You know, you, you want to say, well, why isn't it? Let me understand your, your customer base a little bit more. And sometimes it requires a visit to the store. Sometimes it requires a, a five minute conversation. And sometimes it can be as simple as, as putting a small sign somewhere, which is, it's just simple. Um, but, but what you want to do is you want to build that rapport so that they know you, they know your products, they understand what you're able to offer and they trust you. And once they trust you, they're going to be more willing to recommend everything. And uh, I, I think that that helps because that builds the sell through that builds, uh, you know, when it comes to the time when they want to do something special and they reach out to you, that's an advantage. It's not uh, it's, you know, it's a lot of work. It takes time yeah. to build. Um, and, you know, as a, I'm sure as a business owner, you know, you get pitched at like probably 200 times a day for something that you'd never, ever, ever wanted. Yeah. Um, and they get it, too. So yeah. you, you want to you know, you, you you've done something to draw their interest and. Uh, so you use fair as the channel. The channel is that, Hey, you guys bought my stuff on fair. Um, what else can I do for you? Um, I want my stuff to be successful. They definitely want your stuff to be successful. And a lot of people don't understand it, that it's the beginning there, not necessarily the, the, the stopping point. Got it. Um, so and it, sales is a lot of work. Sales is more work it than is. the manufacturing I mean, and, it's and everything else. It's definitely a lot. I mean, and that's one of the reasons why I first even started. Cause to be honest with you, um, I try to go the route of like, you know, like the whole idea of social media following, inter interacting with the different stores on their social media, and then from there, then sliding into the direct message and being like, hey, really love your stuff, been following you for a while. Here's my whole, like, I'd love to be part of your store. Here's my wholesale, like my wholesale site. Um, I'm also on fair if that makes it a little bit easier for you. And uh, And I did that for a good maybe two months where I was like constantly just like looking and searching, trying to find is it my is it my kind of store? And it's a lot of work because it's like, uh, you know, you're you're a lot of people either no one responding back to you, uh, mm -hmm. or you know, a lot. It's probably more like that, and and then because you're kind of sliding in, and like if they're not following you, then they're like showing up in some like other area. Um, and then I even followed up with emails to them because I was like the next thing I was like, okay, let me do this. That way, when they see me, they see it via email. They know. Um, so it's always been like, it's, it's obviously a, a bunch of layers and that's one of the reasons why I was like, Hey, this would be good. Like the idea of being on a catalog 
type thing because if I can get, you know, same idea. Like I don't want to rest on let re- depend just on fair and like places like that. I want to be able to kind of build my own because obviously. I don't mm-hmm. want them taking if I don't have to get commissioned or anything like that and I can actually keep my own money, um, that would be great. So I'm like, that's something that I've been trying to build as well. So that's why I'm always intrigued, because, like, I see how you have like how you're across the country in different on all different types of stores. And obviously, I know you know, you're doing it in multiple ways. So it's like a lot of you know, you're obviously doing quite a bit. So I'm, I'm always intrigued by how you've been successful and being able to accomplish that. It's it, it, food also works with a lot of intermediaries too. I don't know if clothing does because I'm not familiar with it as yeah. much. But in, with food, it's a lot of uh, you know. Fair is a good example. Like I got introduced to fair through the guys at Ancient Olive in Winter Park, and this was a few several you know four, about four years ago, and they wanted to do it partly because it's easier for them to to do their buying and accounting through a yep. single channel than it is to work with all these different vendors. And I know through uh, like some of the, the 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 supermarket chains we work with when we started directly and you would have just billing error after billing error and chasing it because they, they're going through distributors and singles and, and closeouts and other things like that. Um, with channels like FAIR, the first question is also, is the customer I'm approaching, like, do they want to be on FAIRs? I've met people who kind of do and kind of don't. They're afraid they're signing up for something that they don't want. Yeah. Um, some people are, are you know, it, you have to be savvy with technology, not super savvy, but some of it, and some of them don't want to do that because they, they're afraid to. Yep. Um, so you have to have a number of options available, not just direct, but, you know, and then also use, use those channels for what they can do for you and your retailer. Um, fair, for example, uh, like I, I, I've gotten a lot of international customers through fair because for the first year they're willing to absorb the cost of shipping, sending to Europe. So they don't have to worry about, you know, a, a case of hot sauce is like 110 bucks to send to like Norway or something like that. Wow. And if they're going to absorb that and, and, and then do the customs work and the, the VAT and stuff, then there's, there's very little pressure for them. You know, yeah. 40, 40 bucks for a thing of hot sauce is nothing compared to the $200 I have to spend to, to do it traditionally. Mm-hmm. And then for you to buy into a distribution channel, that means you have to show that you can move everything because the distributor doesn't want to keep it in the warehouse. Yeah. So you have to kind of think where the end is and what perks you can offer. The, the And, that, you know, the other thing with fairs is, is a lot of them are, 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 they're not, you know, with Amazon too, it's, it's, it's algorithm based. And so what you have to do is understand how the algorithm works. Um, and, you know, for Amazon or Etsy or something like that, it's a lot of repeat buyers from the same thing. Like how many times do they buy your same stuff? This boosts you up in the listings Uh, with fair it's promotions. Um, It's how many people you're bringing to fair because fair's ultimate goal is, is to have a large mailing list, mailing list is money. Yeah. I I Um, noticed that. I noticed the big push on that when it comes to, uh, Hey, what sent, let it, let everyone know about us. Yeah. It's a lot, you know, and, and there's an advantage to it because there's, there's people who are, who are, starting stores now that have fair where, where I started, it was hard to sell it. Um, the same with abound and other things that abound is again, repeat purchase by the, you know, the same thing you get boosted. Um, like if you take your shirts, for example, and you just do a 5% discount, um, and then offer a sample pack, uh, with some stickers and things like that and throw it in, that would go a long way in increasing your search results. It takes a couple of months to get there, but those, those are the things and know, know what the case pack is and yeah. make sure that the financials work out for you and, and, uh, factor in that, that hefty commission. And, and, uh, but those, those are the things that, that really push you on the, on the search engine. And uh, then, you know, when they tell you to modify your, your listing with the new gizmo thing that we have in there, then do that too, because they're, they're looking for feedback on that as well. Yeah. Um, that's great. That's that's awesome advice. Like I, I really appreciate it because, like I said, I'm brand new to it and I'm I've only been in it a few months. I've had some success on it, so I I kind of be like, okay, this is great. But I really do feel like you know it's kind of like once you reach a point and I and I've been trying to sing the prices and tell a lot of other small businesses about it. Like, hey, you should really mm-hmm. consider at least the your low ticket items like your pins and your stickers and things that you can kind of produce that are low low cost. That for you, I'm like, it's well worth it to be able to kind of get yourself out there any way that you can, you know, more exposure. There's nothing wrong with more exposure across the country, um, especially to your brand. So I definitely, uh, I definitely appreciate that. What, um, where can people follow? How can they shop online for you uh, and check out your sauces and your condiments? Um, Fatcatfoods.com. You can easily just buy us straight from there. We're on Amazon. We're in Walmart. We're on Etsy. Uh, we sell through a lot of intermediaries, hot sauce.com, uh, peppers.com, uh, 
you can just just Google it and it'll it'll show up. Um, I, I'm happy to promote anybody who 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 wants to resell my stuff. Uh, they're, they're, it's all very very supportive and thankful. Uh, we do sell them a lot of places. A lot of them are competitively priced. A lot of stuff you find online is not us selling it directly. I don't know. Sometimes I don't even know how it gets to certain places. It just does because wow. uh, you sell to intermediaries. Yeah. Um, and uh, like we sell to distributors, we sell to, to resellers, we sell, you know, the, the keys to get it out there. So it moves and you can build your demand and, and, your, and, and, and things like that. Uh, the best place to social, we don't do so much because it's a lot of time. I don't have a lot of time to do a lot of social, but our Instagram is at Pat Cat Sauces. Um, usually it's cat pictures or, you know, or sauce. Sauce, sauce pictures. <laughs> so, uh, and then we do do events, but we don't do as many uh, like local events lately. It's a little bit tricky right now with, with uh, how things are happening and then the amount of time and then, and then also the weather permitting and stuff in Florida is a little tricky. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, th- those are the best places to find us. Uh, messages whatever whatever you like um you know we're out there just just give a just look find us yeah yeah, yeah. De- and you definitely will see when you when you when you see their their sauces when you see like their labels and everything you'll be like oh okay this makes sense uh it makes <laughs> it makes total sense Ail, how do you balance your how do you balance your day because you're you're kind of all over you're kind of i'm assuming all over the place whether you're trying to like you know, you're juggling, trying to figure out and all the, you know, handling different customers, doing the, making sure things are going on the packaging side. Is there a way that you kind of balance how you try to balance your day or try to at least kind of keep a, keep some sanity with it? I I start early. Uh, Most of the first half of the day is, is packing orders and getting stuff kind of uh, ready. Uh, The logistics of this business is the center point of everything, as I'm sure you understand as well. If you don't know how to pack it and ship it efficiently and get it out, especially because uh, Amazon's requirements and Walmart's requirements are, are higher. Um, I have to get it to the customer within a couple of days unless they're doing it themselves and, and things like that. Um, so the shipping is very, very uh, I, I like we have a three day weekend coming up. This is a glorious time because I, I can't once they, they order after 11 o'clock on Saturday, I don't have to wait to do, do anything until Tuesday. So you're, you have your, your day off, but it's a lot of shipping in the morning. Now it's very hot. So usually uh, the warehouse has fans, but it doesn't have AC. So we, uh, we kind of by 1130, I'd like to be done with it. And then usually it's planning uh, sales calls, sales stuff in the afternoon. Um, it may change as the winter comes. It's a little more temperate. But uh, and then, you know, you, you travel around, you visit, you visit, uh, you usually take one or two days a week to visit customers um, and kind of uh, make sure your stuff is, is being merchandised correctly yeah. or you, you know, calls with people and stuff. You know, it's a business. It's all yeah, I was going to say that that's got to be a tough one, especially since you're in so many different markets and, and within the ma- massive retails as well as the smaller ones. And that, that whole placement, like where's the placement at? Are you actually are you actually conveying the message of what my brand's about or my sauces are about and the whole teaching and having that aspect of it, especially at the smaller, um, smaller venues or smaller specialty markets? Um, I can imagine like the there's a lot there's definitely a lot of uh, making brand awareness um, is uh, is sure. is definitely a, a huge thing. I'm, I'm, I'm imagining, um, especially with the different, you know, when you have such an array of flavors um, when it comes to your sauces. It's, it's a lot of, I do have a, like a lot of, of documents I share, you know, Google Docs and stuff like that, where these are the suggestions I have to, to, to ship, uh, to how to sell my stuff. Um, sometimes, uh, like, you know, I have talking points. I have uh, what to do to taste hot sauce, you know, because it's spicy. You don't want to offend people. Um, so you make, you make documents that you can share. And if it doesn't work, then you want to make sure that that, that, uh, that retailer understands you know you, you sometimes you got to go and see with a shop all the shops are a little different um or you work with people who are really supportive who will carry your message with you um it's it's you know it's it's mostly sales it's sales and fulfillment and and, yeah. and and things like and logistics logistics is huge logistics is logistics is huge well i really appreciate um you taking the time with for me to talk to, to talk today i i appreciate you've always been amazing um you know in our years because i've been i'll be in business 10 years um in january oh, wow. so like That's i've been crazy. uh and and yeah it's it's kind of nuts it's kind of nuts and uh and so it's kind of it's amazing to see and very inspiring to see what you've uh what you've accomplished in the last 12 years um with this business so i definitely appreciate your you, time man. thank you I so mean, much I, man. I, I've, I've met many people who are like what do i do for a clothing brand and i'm like look at this guy man he's, he's hustling you gotta hustle 
This guy yeah. doesn't 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 take it lightly. So no, congrats you got, to you yeah. as well. I mean, it's definitely it's definitely. I totally uh, I appreciate it because I definitely think that you're right. It's there is definitely a hustle, especially when it's something that is uh, is something you're developing, you've created, and uh, and who else who else better to do it than you to be able to kind of uh, kind of be able to give that and spread that word. So I, I definitely appreciate it. Well, that's our show for today. Thank you so much to to Ale Goldschmidt um, of Fat Cat Foods of and Fat Cat Sauces for being on and having lunch with me to show to, with me today. Make sure to check them out online. Um, obviously, if you're at the grocery store and you see anything, I definitely appreciate would love for you to take a little selfie with it. Maybe pick one up and take it and try it at home. Uh, let us know what you think of it. Um, if you enjoyed the show, definitely make sure to subscribe and tell your friends. If you want to support me, uh, check out my brand, Deli Fresh Threads. Um, make sure to do some shopping. I always talk about sandwich selfies. I have I like to see them, so make sure you send a picture of it if you're listening. Thank you. Until next time, keep eating sandwiches and follow your passion. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, sir.